Il passe au ouais Super bel artiste Super oh, Encore un but sensationnel Hello everybody, welcome to the Uniformed Handball Hour. This is Brian Campion speaking to you. Of course, I'm joined by Chris O'Reilly. And finally, he's back from his long holidays. Alex Kulesh, back from Costa Rica. How are you boys? <laughs> hey boys, I'm feeling good. I think it says a lot about our imbalance in life that we see a week and a half or two weeks in costa rica as a long long holiday for alex <laughs> hey two and a half weeks in two and september and a half weeks. Is, a, is a nice nice way to do it i'm coming back with a tan seeing everyone around me getting paler and paler and it's a it's a nice feeling <laughs> i think it felt longer for me because uh, i wasn't on the podcast the last podcast a year or two uh, yeah. together so maybe it felt a bit longer in that regard but uh, for the fans at home you're all missing out on Alex's lovely uh, super tan at the moment. So. <laughs> Did you find any handball in Costa Rica? I didn't. I didn't find a ham- any handball. Um, there was a lot of football. Beautiful, lush pitches in Costa oh. Rica everywhere. Just it was rainy season, um, which means that every single football pitch was just beautiful okay. that I saw. I think it's it's primarily football there. Um, and I didn't quite look for the handball halls. I was kind of sticking to the beaches and the and the mountains and, and the rainforests a little bit more. Fair enough. Fair enough. So what we're going to do here is a quick podcast, maybe I hope. I think anyway, because we're going to have a pretty regular podcast coming over the next few weeks as we build up to the Women's Euro, which is just under a month away. So we have some preview podcasts and a feature interviews uh, together with that so we're going to run through everything else and this podcast has been happening over the last couple of weeks and the last time we spoke me and you brian it was just before you were heading over to magdeburg for the psg magdeburg game in the champions league uh, do you want to start there yeah i think probably something i didn't really expect i've been to lots of psg games when psg come to town and for clubs like obviously magdeburg have been out of the champions league for quite a while I was outside the arena just doing the normal arrivals and it was quite a big crowd of fans there. And that's to be expected when you go to a PSG game. And as soon as the PSG bus pulled up, then the crowd gathered over and I was thinking, okay, yeah, they're all here for all the PSG stars. And one by one, all the PSG stars get out of the bus. And them, they too were kind of double taken because no one was turning to look to them at all. And they're just kind of, they walked in as normal. And then Yannick Green gets out, or Yannick Green gets out of the, the bus. And people are like, oh, there he is. And uh, everyone's cheering and roaring and, and chanting Yannick. Wow. I couldn't believe it. And there was a guy there standing with the Nikola Karabatic uh, post, a big like, sign, a big um, framed picture of Nikola Karabatic. And one of the media managers gets off the bus and goes, oh, Nicola's not playing today. And your man goes, no, I'm waiting for Yannick. I want Yannick to sign his, <laughs> so the Yannick Green to, <laughs> to sign his, uh, his <laughs> picture of Nicola Karabatic. <laughs> I just thought it was gas. Like, and then uh, the players were all walking in and they're all just there. And the amount of gifts and memorabilia and jerseys that people were handing Yannick, he really is uh, a bit of a, a small legend in uh, Magdeburg and even after the game when they lost as well he won player of the match of course and kind of shut up shop for them for PSG and uh, was had an unbelievable game and even then when he was walking around the arena he, people were just still shouting his name and chanting Yannick Green right. so it was, it was quite incredible to see that because uh, I think I've seen people go back to their old clubs at games but I've never seen a response quite like that and I, I kind of, I thought I knew it was going to be big, as well, because my taxi ride on the way to the arena, I get into the taxi and the guy's looking at me and kind of smiling, and he goes, "Oh, I see your shoes," and I was like, because I was wearing Hummel shoes, and he's like, and he's like, "Oh, handball, is it?" And I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "I'm friends with all the lads for Magdeburg," and his name was uh, Uli, and he was telling me all the times over the years, and he lived actually next door to Yannick Green. And Yannick Green, on his last day before he left to go to Paris, uh, his wife was looking for one of his like jerseys or uh, tracksuit tops or something like that. 
And Yannick said he'd given them all away, but he was going to do one last sweep of the house before he left and didn't hear from him for a day. And then he was leaving the next morning and he, and he runs out with, uh, calls him actually. He says, I'm leaving now I've, and I've got something for your wife. And he handed him the last piece of Magdeburg memorabilia that he had uh, sitting around his house. Hearing a lot of really good stories about Yannick Green when I was there and how nice of a guy he is. So he's gone up a lot in uh, in my book. And the last podcast, he even said that he's a really nice guy. So <laughs> you already... Yeah, yeah, yeah that is. <laughs> That's right up there then. Yeah, he's just the nicest guy in the okay. you know, hands down. <laughs> But there's, there was actually another story. You might have to cut this one out, Chris. I'm not sure I can tell this on air, but uh, the, the taxi driver, um, he he got a phone call from his wife when I was on the way out to the arena. And uh, he was I think he was kind of how only half listened to what I was saying because his wife picked up and he was like, oh yeah, I have a guy from Eurosport in the car with me here. He's going to the handball game. I was like, fucking Eurosport. <laughs> anyway, and then his wife pulls up. <laughs> beside us and he was, she was looking in the window she goes is that the guy from Eurosport and I was like how, <laughs> yeah how are you <laughs> and, she, and she's about half the age of this guy as well this guy's like 60, 60 something I think and then she was like in her maybe late 30s and uh, they pull, pull off anyway and he, he turns to me and goes that's my wife and I go yep yeah. and he's like she's nice isn't she and I was like <laughs> yeah and then we pull up to the hall and he goes to me uh, make sure you tell Yannick I said hello today Uli the taxi driver and I was like yeah okay I'll do my best if I, if I get chatting to him and he's like he won't forget me and I was like okay and I go can I just get a receipt there and he goes oh yeah yeah and he's there signing the whole receipt and he puts his iPhone down uh, do you know on the jo- on the um, not the joystick geez you know I'm not a driver <laughs> on the uh, <laughs> on the what do you call it on the joystick <laughs> what do you call that thing <laughs> What do you call that thing? The, the, the stick? No, the yeah, clutch. Whatever. The gear stick. The, gear, it's the, clutch. It's the clutch, yes, the clutch or the gear stick? You know I don't have a license. Oh, the, the gear, gear stick, stick. okay. Gear stick. You know I don't have a license. <laughs> the joystick. <Anyway. laughs> and he puts, he puts his phone down on, the, on, the, on the, 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 the gear stick and he goes, oh, what's the date today? So he, he, he taps his phone to get the, the, his, to get the date up and it's a full topless picture. <laughs> <laughs> of his girlfriend and I'm just like and he just looks back at me and looks at me, and I'm looking back and I'm looking up and down and, I'm, and he's just like yep yeah. and I'm like yep yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make sure to say hello to Yannick Green from me and my wife I got the receipt and then I get out of the car and I'm walking away and he kind of he's pulling out to reverse back down he re- pulls all the way back down beside me and window goes down and he goes remember if you see Yannick and I'm like yep yeah, don't worry I won't forget you <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm afraid that's going to have to stay in the podcast maybe that's what uh, inspired Yannick Green uh, to have such a big game and a, and a very important game uh, for PSG I think as well uh, to kind of to win that after um, after a loss in the league and yeah it could have kind of led to a bit of a spiral if they came out again and uh, um, had a bit of trouble yeah it was uh, impressive because we were quite worried about what, how would it be for PSG? But to go to Germany and go to Magdeburg and, and perform that way, they were really quite dominant in that game. After all, I think it was a bit of a wake-up call for Magdeburg as well. It's like, welcome to the big leagues. Uh, where you're not going to just walk away with victories in every home game. Uh, but there you go. Have you been anywhere else since then? I've been to an FTC game, FTC Brest. That was, I think, the week before, though, I think, if I can remember correctly. Um, and I'll be going to uh, two Euro games next week, which should be should be good. So Germany, Sweden in the Euro Cup, and then Bosnia Herzegovina versus Montenegro in Sarajevo, which should be pretty wild. And I heard earlier in the week that just only a few weeks ago they've officially banned smoking in halls in Sarajevo. So I think I just missed out on that experience of people smoking in the stands. That's gone now for the last couple of weeks. So uh, I'll have missed that because I was kind of looking forward to something really wild. But yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's go- it's going to be wilder. You're just going to have all these people who are usually chuffing away at cigarettes just sitting in the stands for at least 30 minutes not being able to smoke. And getting really agitated with everything that happens on the court, mm. so getting angrier and angrier and angrier, uh, where, where they can't control their stress with a bit of nicotine. So it it could yeah. be it could be wild. It could be. 
throwing nicotine patches on the court we'll see <laughs> uh yeah i'll be uh i've had two very different euro games uh next week we've talked a bit about the euro in a, in a bit um any other games you want to look back on in the last couple of weeks how about you alex one thing that we should probably talk about is the continued demise of pig's Eggett. oh yeah this is just getting it's getting worse and worse um and after their loss to Albor, where they really they shot the bed. <laughs> <laughs> like a, there's, there's nothing more I can say uh, about that. They lost 41 29 at home in their brand new arena. Yeah, record goals conceded for them in a home game. Yeah, Banhidi was back, so um, his in- he's been injured for a while, so maybe that, you know, I was thinking a uh, bit of an excuse there if, if they're not firing at their best, but they have a full squad and they're just, they're still on zero points in the group. They've won every game in, in Hungary, but it just seems to be spiraling and they had to come out with an official apology as a club after that loss against Albor. Um, I'm sure there's uh, a lot of people really asking for um pastor's head um it, I, I don't know you know hungary isn't generally the most forgiving of places for coaches and this has been a really detrimental start i think he survived by the skin of his teeth last year by winning the hungarian league um i think they had an underwhelming season again anyway um it will just it'll take something special for them to get out of this hole and i'm not really sure if they will, um, I think they they probably have a chance to qualify um, into next round. I think they're not really out with Salia and El- Elverum as their competition. But, you know, if they come up against one of the top teams in the other group, they're just going to get run over again. And it's, it's yeah, it's not pretty. And the next game is at home to Elverum, which is a really dodgy game to have now. Uh, Elverum have not been good by any means we talked a little bit about that last time they're not the team they were for the last couple of seasons but they did beat Seged away from home last season and uh yeah I'd be a bit nervy if I were Seged going into this one <laughs> given the given the form they are in I mean they have the international break now to kind of reset a little bit but yeah it's really not looking good for them particularly when Celia are you know looking fairly all oh, right. I mean, they they played a good game against uh, Barca in round three. Even though they lost, they got smacked a little bit by Nantes. But you know, they have those two points over Kiel, which uh, Zagat don't have yet. Have you guys watched much of Zagat? Because I haven't. I've I've watched bits of them, um, but I I can't really tell why they're so bad. I think they're they're quite slow. I I, I think their pace that's the main thing I've picked up on. I think their mm. pace is a bit slow. Um I watched I basically watched the first fifteen minutes of their season and then I had to go off and uh do something else. But <laughs> in that fifteen minutes I, I've watched more of the, more of Zegat since then. But yeah. that those first fifteen minutes uh Dayan Bombats came out and was just full of energy, full of speed. The team was back. It, it just looked amazing. Mm. And then that just disappeared. So it's it's somewhere there, but um, it just seems to be a mess uh, at the moment. It's, it seems to be the same in every game. It's a pretty close first half, and then they just disappear. I mean, it was the same against Alborg. They were down by just two. I think it goes back to the point that you made last season about this team, is that it's so heavily reliant on long range shooting from the left and right backs and this and then the connection with Ban Edi on the line. Ban Edi hasn't been there, which is a big a big gap for them in that team. And maybe they're just a little bit too uh easily read by opposition. But that that doesn't that doesn't account for the forty one goals you concede at the other end against Alborg. Um I mean that that I you have to give Alborg credit. They look very good in that game. But yeah, and the keepers were just up to nothing. Uh, I think Roland Mikler was on 23% and Alilovic on 18%. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, it's a dire situation for them. And I, the way the crowd booed at the end of that game, it's like there's really no patience. 
Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I think uh, you just have to mention Mega Martins and all of this as well, because this uh, lack of ingenuity that we're talking about here, I think he was supposed to be the solution for that. Mm. He's the dynamic backcourt player who can kind of play anywhere and pop up and do something exciting um, when they need it. And he has been an absolute disaster for them. He, he's been, he, he just has, he's been irrelevant. Um, it, it's a pity. I think that can go down as one of the worst transfers in history, not because of kind of uh, Miguel Martin's performance in itself, but the impact it had on both teams. Mm. I think <laughs> my, Miguel Martin moving made two teams worse, and I can't remember too many players who have been able to do that. Yeah, because it's funny when, like, when he was playing his best handball back in Porto, it almost seemed like this one of the safest transfers. Everywhere, because when you, when you watched Miguel Mar- Martins when he was flying for Porto, it was just seemed like you you felt anyway you could almost put put him in any team and he would do a job for you. And very shortly after you arrived there, I remember I was down in Zeged and the way they were talking about him, very early on, even after a few games, they're like, "Oh yeah, it's I, I mean, don't think he's quite ready for the way we play." And even the way they were talking about it behind the scenes, it's it seemed like maybe it wasn't it wasn't quite the the match that they they thought it was going to be and. Uh, and yeah, I think probably it's right what you said there, uh, Alex, about them playing slow and sluggish and what you said also, Chris, but it feels like there's maybe something maybe bigger going on as well. And I don't know if that's maybe something to do with the, the coaching team becoming, when you see, when you hear teams playing like slow and when they lack ideas or they, they kind of crumble after the first bit of adversity, um, often that can be then linked with maybe kind of a general unhappiness with the setup in some way. And they are under a lot of pressure in a lot of different ways with the new stadium as well. Even behind the scenes, they were talking about how it's, impo- how it's really important to get good results next season, this season, uh, to fill the arena uh, because they've invested a huge amount into that as well. So there could be, a, I think there's a, f- a few different things going on there um, and it won't be an easy fix because they've been also very loyal to Pastor over the years. So it's going to be very interesting to see now Will they stick by him this time when they're really their backs are properly against the wall? One very quick mention is Barcelona scoring forty six goals uh, against Elverum, just uh, absolutely tearing them apart and looking scarier and scarier by the minute. They just didn't miss. Um, also, just the pace of uh, that last round, where on Thursday night games. Each one of them had a, a score of 40 in it, including, I think, the big game of the night, which was uh, lightning fast and intense, and that was Kielsa versus Kiel. And we saw Andy Wolf just rising to the occasion. You know, he's doing it more often. These days, 16 saves, including two seven meters and one basically game-winning uh, seven-meter save in the last... Um, I think minute and a half to basically clinch the game for them. Um, really impressive by Kielsa. Again, just Kiel. Something's just not quite clicking. Um, they seem to be really up and down. And not that they're playing bad, but they seem to be dropping too many games for for how they're playing. Because they, they seem to be playing well, but they just keep conceding goals and... Uh, dropping games, including as well um, in the Bundesliga where they got absolutely torn apart by Fuchs of Berlin and Matthias Gissel. It's impressive when you, you can see 37 goals, but you still have an amazing game, like in Andy Wolf's case. It <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, like- says a lot for the pace of the game where he concedes 37 and still has a 30% save rate. But yeah, it was uh, another case of a, of a player coming back to haunt their old team. Uh, not the first time he's faced them. I'm actually just going to ask you guys a question as well because I haven't seen a whole lot of the Bundesliga, but a player who I think it's probably a bit unfair to say he's been a surprise, but I think maybe surprising how quickly he's fit into the, the Kielsebo would be Eric Johansson, mm. and he scored his nine goals against uh, Kielsa. He's looked very good in the Champions League, but I wanted to ask you then, is he looking as good in the Bundesliga or not? Because I haven't really seen him on that side. Until today, yes. I mean, he was their top scorer in the Bundesliga. And I mean, today he, he didn't play badly today being Sunday and they lost to, to Berlin. As Alex said, I had that game, uh, commentating that game earlier today. And it was a surprise that he didn't start the match today against Berlin. 
there was Carl Valenius, the other young Swede who got the start at left back. And maybe even one of the, the things, I mean, many things they were, they were second best in, but that's one thing that you could maybe point towards that that was a mistake that he didn't start the game uh, because Valenius didn't really uh, contribute too much uh, in that match. Uh, yeah, he's been really, really good. What he, I think, delivers is pure fearlessness when it comes to taking on shots. He's happy to, to take on a shot anywhere. He, he does tend to drift a little bit into the center. And I think he was punished for that today against Berlin because they really did. They really were happy to, to drag him into the center and then, uh, and deal with him. And also with Milos Avlev and Gold dealing with, with them. But overall, I've been very impressed with what I've seen from him. Yeah, me too. And I think he really does remind me of Philip Iha, a real raw Philip Iha. I think they have a similar build mm. and a, a similar ferocity. There is just the fearless nature of Eric Johannesson is what's uh, really impressed me. He really dives into every challenge. He has the kind of physical ability to also dive into everything and survive. Um, so I think it's a good match between Yeeha and um, Johansson to hopefully shape him and just get him polished a little bit because uh, he is still a little bit raw to really be kind of taking over games every week in and week out yeah uh, so i see a lot of potential and um, i really like him and i think there's a really good match with um philip Iha. but it, it, it's it was interesting watching that game between uh keel and fix of berlin as well because it was this bit of a clash of styles because fix of berlin are the you know the small ball handball team they, they've embraced they're the new with, magdeburg uh, <laughs> they're the new magdeburg they're a new Bahrain, the, the originators <laughs> yeah. of a uh, small ball handball. <laughs> um, but they're just lightning fast. Um, they take players one-on-one. And I think handball defenses have uh, evolved a lot where it's a lot of aggressive one-on-one defense mm. that happens. So like you're, you know a player, if, if he touches the nine meter line, he's just going to score. So you, you have to anticipate that get out early and make the tackle but when you have Matthias Giesel running up at full pace as you're stepping up or um Jakob Holm as well he he has that uh one-on-one capability as well when they take it at full pace those those defenders that mm-hmm. are coming up thinking you know they're gonna tackle a uh, a big uh, shooter you know trained to go out and tackle a big shooter they're just exposed um, on that nine mirror line. And Kiesel just slices through defenses like butter. If you just watch the first five minutes, that was Matthias Kiesel at his very, very best. Uh, he, I think he got two, two minutes against him. He got um, a couple of goals, a couple of assists, and a couple of assists that should have been scored. Mm. And he's leading that fast break and adding to the pace. So, that was just so effective. There was so much. I, I think this was, I think you tweeted a couple of weeks ago or even last week about Berlin not unlocking Giesel's potential. Today was the day that we saw Giesel do everything he's capable of doing. Not just in attack, but also in defense. You see the steal he got on uh, Nik- uh, Nikola Bilic? He was like, just like hustled him all the way to the halfway line, got the ball rolled over and passed it to, to Paul Drucks for an empty net goal. Uh, he was amazing. And can you imagine how training is like when you have to face Giesel and Jakob Holm for like an hour and a half every day? It must be an absolute so nightmare. Uh, I can imagine just Marcinic getting embarrassed <laughs> every single training, yeah. but that's that's what you need. <laughs> and, and he he today Marcinic was the player of the match. He was fantastic. He was. He's, yeah. he. I'm like, where the hell did this guy come from? Uh, nine goals, I think he scored from ten. And uh, a Jakob Holm, I just love the, you know, that move. Like his spin moves are brilliant. But what I like most about him that I really in the last couple of weeks have. I've noticed more than ever. I don't know if he's just improving at it, but he, unlike most handball players, does not shoot 
at like the top of their jump or on the way down. He shoots on the way up. So he jumps mm. and he releases as he's on his way up and it catches the goalkeepers out every single time because his shots are always such pure wrist or elbow. He, there's no arm, there's no, there's no arm movement and there's no full jump. He's on the way up and then, then it's gone. And there's times where it's just like being shot at the keeper or at Landine. It's just gone past his head because it's gone already. And it's, it's a really interesting weapon. And Giesel was just phenomenal. That the assist he gave to Marcinic, where he was floating, being attacked, being defended by two players, and then just flicks it behind his back in the most beautiful way. He starts to run off as Marcinic lobs the keeper, and it is a replay of him like with a big smile on his face. He's like, "Yes, people are going to be looking at this for months." And uh, it was just Berlin were amazing. They confirmed themselves as title contenders today. Yeah, absolutely. And just to confirm here, in terms of not unlocking Giesel's f- full potential for Berlin, it's that they're um, they're just holding him back in games that don't matter as much. The two games we've seen, so it was against Flensburg where he got eleven goals, and against Kiel um, this weekend where he was an absolute star. So they're they're just holding him back making sure he's not broken by the mid stage of a season and not for the lack of trying from all of the big bundesliga bruisers around there who are just trying to take his head off or not not trying to take his head off just are incapable of um holding on with him one on one and uh, yeah so Gisel's just being held back a little bit uh, making sure that he can um, survive the Bundesliga strain um, on a week by week basis, and just being unleashed in the big, big games, and that has worked so far. It's interesting when there where you said, uh, uh, Chris, about uh, Holmes' shot. How he kind of releases it as he's on the way up, or before he reaches the top of his jump. If we go back, way back in the day, back in like the nineteen forties, handball. Um, that's the way everyone used to shoot, and it was only till Hansi Schmidt came along, who played for Gummersbach, who did, who invented basically the delayed shot, and he basically changed the game. And then everyone started doing this delayed shot where you would hold onto the ball, and then Luke Abelo did it a bit too much, where he would. <laughs> uh, so, so home now is kind of re- he's going back real old school again. So uh, maybe that's what we're going to see now. They're, this kind of uh, everyone's going to be shooting. When they just take off from the ground or before they reach the top of their jump. But uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bundesliga is really developing nicely, I have to say, uh, these weeks. Rannick and Leuven, top of the league, which is a bit of a surprise. We talked about that last time. And they face Kiel in the next game after the international break, which is going to be fun. Uh, Flensburg lost uh, a bit surprisingly today. And uh, I've, that's dealt a bit of a blow to them. Erlangen up there with only one loss so far. I think they're the big surprise package in a in a positive sense. Magdeburg uh, still in touch, just one defeat for them. So there's really uh, there's a bunch of real contenders in the in the league this season. Really hard to know. And also, I think that it's going to be a big challenge for Kiel and Magdeburg to balance the Champions League and the Bundesliga particularly when it seems like there's a big game coming almost every week for them. Yeah, it it looks like it's going to be an absolute battle for that Bundesliga title not just for a title for a European place yeah. as you mentioned those five teams including Flensburg who are in seven in seven yeah what one of them is not going to make a European um spot so Rheinneck Leuven, Fix Berlin, Kiel, Magdeburg and Flensburg it's it's a real it's a real battle Flensburg are a little bit all over the place um I'm not yeah, I, they beat Magdeburg, kept their season alive basically by beating Magdeburg, and then go out there and play an absolute stinker against Lemgo. Um, their backcourt players, uh, it was Magnus Rud, Sugo, and Masmes Larsen, who was the hero in that game against Magdeburg, getting mm-hmm. a last second winner. Um, they went for uh, zero from 10. Uh, and they scored 21 goals as a team that's it's uh, it's it's kind of a surprise to me really there there's some some imbalance because i don't think we can talk about flensburg lack of a squad anymore they do have their players back lassimiller's back 
Magnus Hurd's playing, uh, Sugar is playing. They're not really missing too many players. They're just not clicking. Um, except for that game against Magdeburg. <laughs> and then they did. But they almost threw yeah. it away there as well. That was a bit wild. That was wild. That, yeah, I mean, it's just been the league all season. I mean, every every game I've I've seen has been a real, really interesting in one way or another. And it's just every single week is throwing up a, a contest between like this top five, top six teams, which is, is fun to see. And uh, I also got to do Melsungen for the first time last week when they lost to uh, Berlin. Uh, classic Melsungen style. They, they were going to win the game for 50 minutes and then lost heart- heartbreakingly. So, yeah, good to be good to be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> the Melsungen experience live. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> We only briefly mentioned uh, the Women's Champions League there. Uh, there was a lot of action the last couple of weeks as well. It was a big game. The uh, I saw a Streg Spiller call this one the Super Cup. The, the European League winners against the Champions League winners from last season in uh, Bietigheim against Vipers. And, uh, and Bietigheim won it. So one, one German team that are doing well in Europe. Uh, and that's surprisingly on the women's side. Uh, but you, you were covering some of the games today, Capo. I was, yeah. Did tune into it midway through the second half, and they were losing. I kind of thought, "Oh, the Vipers are going to go, are going to run away with this now." But they did show a lot of a lot of grit there to to stay in it, and then yeah, snatch it right at the end. So that's a that's a huge result um, for them to beat the reigning champions. So uh, I've been to an FTC game there a few weeks ago, and then I watched them um, again today against Krim, and I thought FTC versus Krim with the signings that both teams have made there, I thought it was going to be a a very very interesting uh, tie, but it seemed like Krim played very very much like FTC, <laughs> <laughs> and FTC played maybe like some other team. But uh, yeah, it was very it was very FTC esque the way Krim played. Okay, uh, kind of looked a little bit a, a very scattered, uh, but FTC themselves. I mean, I, when I saw them live there a few weeks ago, it does it does feel like their backcourts a little bit all over the place, and I haven't fully found who should be playing with who, because they've obviously brought someone like Lekic in who's massively experienced. But I feel like Lekic doesn't really match up with some of the other left and right backs Um, because she maybe doesn't have the same pace that she used to have. And what she does is kind of set the attack up well. I think she needs kind of quicker left and right backs beside her because she was on the court today with uh, Zalotzi Zajic in left back and then Kluber in, in right back. And it was kind of like, it was like three snails in the backcourt, basically. Obviously, Kluber's an incredible, an incredible right back, but she's not known for her blistering pace, one against one or anything like that. But she does have, he's an incredible eye for shots and things like that. But those three in backcourt just wasn't working, and they had to uh, take her out and put Jutu Jujanski then in centre back, and then that looked a lot better. And then when Emily Emily Bullock came in, Emily Bullock is just I I don't know it's just, it's she's a she's a bit of a wild player. She's unbelievable in terms of athletic power and speed. But for some reason, she, when you give her a lot of space to shoot from the backcourt, I don't know how many times I've seen it, she just seems to throw it over the bar or just will hit the keeper. It's almost like she needs the contact. Yeah. And when she gets that contact and someone is on, it, on top of her, it's almost a bit like Nikola Karabatic-esque where she can just get the shot away and you often see her scoring like that. But sometimes when, when defenders just stand off her and she's left out drifting, she stays ages in the air and then, and then the shot she releases at the end is just is, leads to nothing. So she definitely has some bits of her game to work on. But when she came on with Zuzanski in the backcourt and, and Kluber in right back, it was a lot better. Um. But yeah, so still a lot of questions there in terms about how they're going to be set up, and uh, I think yeah, Karim will just be will be disappointed because they looked a lot stronger until Daria Daria Dimitrieva got sent off um, in the in the first half for a foul. I didn't even see the foul to be honest. So she was protesting when she came off. So uh, she wasn't too happy with that. But then things went downhill basically for Karim from there. So bit of a weird one. Just a last point on that with. Uh, Kluber. Um so by the stats she actually got a double double in that game with twelve goals and ten assists. Yes. Nice. But I do doubt the the stats in the for assists in the win, women's champions league so far this season, they've been really inflated um relative to what we usually see. But no matter what, officially Kluber got um a double double, twelve goals, ten assists, two blocks as well. 
a real yeah, no. all around performance. No, no, she's really incredible. Don't get me wrong. What I was just saying before was not a slight at her by any means. I was just saying the the combination of the back court doesn't seem to be quite quite mm. working, but she is really quite uh, an absolute. She's by far their best back court player. I mean, we talked a lot about the Women's Champions League with Adrian uh, a couple of weeks ago, but developing nicely there. I think it's uh, both groups looking quite. I mean, it's almost uh, identical actually. Like no team is. Uh, got a perfect record. There's still a couple of teams in both groups with uh, with unbeaten records, so with draws, and uh, then a couple of teams in both groups, or one team in each group, which is an absolute whipping boy or girl, whipping girl in this. That doesn't sound right. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, I watched uh, just one note on Kastamonu, uh, the Turkish team, who now have gone 18 matches in the Champions League without a victory and that was all of last season's group phase and the four games this season they came so close against Storhammer yesterday I was watching that game and uh, they were leading it literally for the entire game until they just just blew it and I feel particularly uh, bad for their Angolan right back Azenaide Carlos who scored 14 goals for Castamone, but still came out in the wrong end of that result. Uh, so that's pretty painful for them. Hopefully they'll be able to pick up their first victory. They play Zagreb next, uh, because that is a, a pretty dire record. Um, on that uh, Super Cup, I already mentioned, uh, yeah, Biedekheim beating Christian Sand. Biedekheim really, really doing well since coming into the Champions League. Uh, we talked a little bit about their lack of depth, though, whether that'll come back to haunt them at a certain point. On to the European League. And I don't know if you guys saw the group phase draw already. It was done uh, towards the end of this week. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Some new teams in there. Yeah, it's a real mashup. I, I was kind of looking at it and um, I, I was looking for a group of death because uh, that's always the fun thing to do when a draw happens. Uh, but I was, I, was, I was looking around and... I was like, oh, okay, what's this team actually like on a you know European level? You know, I do know these the, a lot of the teams that have been drawn in there, but it, it's a nice, completely random mix, and it, it's going to be a chance to, you know, see if uh, Valor from Iceland uh, are any use at this level. You know, we have Benidorm from Spain coming in. We've got Vesprem's second uh, team, as in Vesprem's the city's uh, second <laughs> yeah. team, um, uh, which is also a really funny one because uh, I think all of the Vesprem uh, players are watching that game as the team qualifying were qualifying for the group oh, right. we're cheering them on so <laughs> I saw a video of Kent and Maya watching on the phone they're all on the bus watching their uh, you know their neighbours uh, essentially since they're, it's quite a small town and uh, being really proud of them so that, that's a really nice story uh, the, w- let's let's go for one team that you're excited for and I'll start and that is Skandenborg Aarhus is my team <laughs> that I'm excited for in terms of a random team here um, that, that we haven't seen before. Uh, there's two reasons for that. They have the only remaining uh, Faroese player <laughs> that is uh, still, uh, or let's say the, the best Faroese player that's still in the competition. Um, and let me just get his name. Hakan Vest of Tygum. That that's that's the one, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hawken Tigum and uh, the real star for the Danish under twenty ones, uh, Thomas Arnoldson, uh, mm. who is kind of the leader of that team. Um, they're they're pretty exciting. They they only formed as a club um, a couple of years ago as Aarhus, uh, kind of the the club collapsed slightly. And had to be combined with Skanneborg, but um, there's a bit of momentum there, and I'm pretty excited to see where they end up. Mm, and that guy, Thomas Arnoldson, is going to Al- uh, Talborg next season, right? I believe he has a contract with them from next summer. So Does he? Yeah, I think so. So, yeah, we'll see, see if he's up to it. How about you, Campo? I think there's a few names in there that I think would make anyone excited. So let me just list all of them now. 
God. Did you catch yourself oh. there or was that uh, intended? <laughs> uh, no, I, I genuinely I genuinely lose my voice here. I genuinely do have a few names, but I will I will I will only mention one. <laughs> uh, classic you photo. can mention three but go into detail on one. All How right, about that? All right, all right. <laughs> I'd say I, I, I think just for pure novelty and the history involved with the club, I think it's going to be great to see a team like Valor competing at this level. Because when you look back for them as a club, they're just they're going to have very very talented Icelandic players because they've always had and they always will do. So just to see them and see their raw talent coming into the European League, I think is uh, is going to be quite exciting. So for me, I'd probably go for Valor, but then I'd also say. No, I won't. Let go on. Give us your other two. Go, go on. on. Go on. No, Matt Aleko, I play for FTC, I think would be quite interesting as well. Um, see Alpa Hart uh, in the mix there in Group C with the Austrians representing. I think I have to support them a little bit. And yeah, of course, I think Fuchs of Berlin are going to absolutely crush everyone. Yeah, it'll be funny with Fuchs of Berlin in Group D with the second Bundesliga team, Motor Zaporozhia. Uh, in there (laughs) but nice to see them I think Group B Group B is just super funky I love the look of it with Pauk from France Isla from Sweden Valor from Iceland Flensburg uh, mucking it with this level Uh, Benidorm and FTC it just feels like uh, it's going to be some fun games there uh, all around for me who hasn't been named in one way or another uh, by you guys let me see um, I'm going to go for Frischav Guppingen. I'm just uh, happy to see them back at this level. A team with great pedigree in the in the second tier competitions. Uh, they've won it four times, I think. And uh, they they had to beat Lemgo in the last round to get through. So that's that's good work from them. I think they're they're going to be like that's maybe the toughest group overall. If you look at Benfica, Cadetan. Uh, Göppingen and Montpellier and uh, then you've got the Vesprem team and, and Preshoff in there I think uh, at the top there that's probably the most even in Group A I think so um, and there is yeah it, it is a, a real mix of uh, real top teams in here as well I, I think we're probably all expecting a final four of probably Benfica, Montpellier Flensburg and uh, Fixer Berlin, they're really the big names there. Um, but we all know that with the European League, that's not always the case. Um, and there's probably going to be some surprises here and there. Yeah. So excited to see the team or the players that really start showing up. Because I think one thing that's been really exciting about the European League over the last couple of years is this is where we see the young stars start blossoming. Mm. So that was uh, Skipper last season. Uh, uh, that's why I wa- I'm excited to see uh, Skanderborg Alhus uh, with uh, Thomas Arnoldson. I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of players that show up, including um, Yusuf Farouk, who is on loan oh, yeah. from Kielsa to Granollers. And apparently he has been lighting it up in the Liga Asabal. Um haven't seen any of them in that league, but uh, hopefully catch a few games of him in the European League over the year. Fresh off Göppingen were one of my picks but I end up not saying them because I think somehow I always find it hard to get excited about Frisch F. Guppingen and I don't know what it is exactly but I think it might be their name I think there <laughs> there's something about Frisch F. Guppingen how they're leaning so much hard on that sponsor I just yeah. can't always get can't, I can't get too excited about them but wasn't it Benidorm a few seasons ago that missed out on qualification for the European League and were quite outraged by the whole thing I think it was two seasons ago and there was a bit of a, a small scandal there and they ended up not qualifying for the European League. So I'd imagine they're going to be, they'll have all their bells and whistles on this time, hyper-motivated. Oh, yeah. Was that, was it because they lost to the Fivers, didn't they? Was it a COVID-related thing? I think it was a COVID-related yeah. thing. Yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez, remember that? COVID? 
<laughs> yeah, because didn't they they won I can't remember correctly but they won the first leg and then the second mm. leg was then cancelled yeah then yeah it was their players who had COVID or something along those yeah lines. okay they had to forfeit the points and then Fivers went through but yeah okay that's that's good just on, on gupping it uh, the players they have in the team I mean some exciting guys in there like uh, Jakob Malos is in there Gilberto Duarte uh, Marin Chego uh, Blaj Blagotinchek. Uh so there's a lot of a lot of kind of Players that we're used to seeing at the the top level in there, so I think they're, they're, they're a team to get excited about if they they find their flow. Um, I have a couple of other things. The Danish first division, I the second tier, was rocked or has been rocked in the last couple of weeks on a topic that I think Alex, maybe you could describe best. But Ajax Copenhagen, uh, multiple champions of Denmark back in the forties and fifties and sixties. And a team with a lot of uh, history for developing players uh, are making a bit of a show of themselves. They are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they absolutely are. So it kind of it goes back a lot. So the the club is on the brink of bankruptcy, um, and it comes from actually an effort. Uh, there was an investment into the club over the last couple of years where they really wanted to bring it back up into the. Um, Premier Danish League uh, out of the first division and they invested they bought some players and that kind of didn't go anywhere their women's team uh, is actually quite uh, quite good it's they're they're right at the top of the uh, Premier League on the women's side so but I think that investment um, also because they didn't fully succeed to go up they dra- gradually and gradually kind of drag the club in in there. You know, it's it's a huge club in Copenhagen. Um, you know, huge youth section, huge um, amateur section as well. So it's 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 a real pity uh, that we can see a club like that kind of folding in a country like Denmark, <laughs> which is really the the core of um, where handball is at the core of a lot of people's minds. But it. it they, a couple of weeks ago, they actually cancelled uh, a game, um, and that was against, uh, I think it was against Aarhus, a, a team from Aarhus, who actually travelled all the way down to Copenhagen, and then it was cancelled last minute. Um, and then um, the, the big uh, kind of farce that happened with uh, the players, so the players aren't getting paid, there's issues with kind of the insurance around the club i i actually don't don't know the specifics of it but uh on the brink, brink of bankruptcy um they fielded well they put six players on the team sheet and just before the game was starting they only had four on the court and uh finally the game got cancelled but um i have no idea uh, w- where this situation is gonna go um hopefully um yeah, they they solve those problems with the sal- salaries out. Um, very difficult to see how that all comes together. To be and, honest. and in the game the other day, they they travelled up with six guys in the bus, so that six people did travel, six players did travel. Yeah. So so the club owners and management were fully insistent on them playing with six players, and then two of the players dropped out because they they hadn't been paid. And uh, and there was these insurance issues again, uh, and then so that's how they ended up with only four, which is not enough to play a game. But uh, there was an interview on on TV two, uh, Danish TV two website with uh, one of the players, Julius Stein, who was basically saying it was kind of a relief in the end that uh, they didn't have to play. Imagine playing sixty minutes with just six players. Um, I'm sure we've all done it at some point in our illu- <laughs> illustrious Irish handball careers, uh, but it, it's no fun. Uh, I'm guessing at that level uh, to to do that. So yeah, it's um, yeah, it's a real pity. We'll see how it how it develops. Um, a club with that kind of infrastructure at the the lower levels as well. I think that's the the biggest pity of all. But uh, we shall see. Alex, in your heart of hearts, when you saw. 
the team sheet. Or, <laughs> did you just think for a second, oh, do you know what? I might have a way in here now. <laughs> I'll, I'll warm up my shoulder here. I'll, uh, I'll jog up to, to the hall and see if, uh, see if they need an extra line player. <laughs> I think I actually had a game myself uh, at the time against uh, Copenhagen's like fourth team or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's the level that I'd be playing. Well, that's, that's, that's another thing that was on my mind. Is like, why, why aren't they just getting players up from the lower teams to to play or do you need is there something about the danish division one where you need to have a contract to play is that the insurance issue is that why they can't bring in the amateurs i wonder so so they just don't have any insurance (laughs) (laughs) the players are playing uninsured and they they have been playing since august uninsured oh Uh, god so that that is a major issue then there's the salary issue and then so a player going up from a lower team Mm. i don't think is insured uh, at that level and the danish uh, handball federation does not um condone that at all uh, as far as i know fair enough so what else have we got here ah yes well you were mentioning there how you would have liked to uh see some of uh yusufara connection for granoyes in the the spanish league and I think we've talked about this before, and it's kind of a it's kind of an obvious thing. But why we need to see more streaming from leagues? And I treated myself to an English handball league game, a Premier League game yesterday, because they have they've made a bit of an effort now and, and are going to be streaming games throughout the season in a, in a pretty professional setup. So I think they have a, a couple of different cameras. They have two guys who are doing commentary. Uh, Jack Oliphant is one of them who who played uh, a fair bit of handball in his day. So I was watching West London Eagles against Great Dane or London GD uh, in the women's competition, the first game of the season. And, and knowing a few of the players from both teams, it was uh, enjoyable to watch as well. But it was a draw in the end, a dramatic 22-22 draw. But what I like about it most, and I think handball needs to, to kind of capitalize on this a little bit, is it so relatable for most of us who have any experience in handball? Because honestly, West London Eagles should have won the game. They had like all these chances towards the end of the game, clean through on goal and just like completely missing. It was getting very dramatic, (laughs) right? Because there were these like brilliant opportunities to score and they just weren't putting them away. Nerves or fatigue or whatever it was. And I just think we need to see more of that because... I don't know about you guys, but there is there is a online and particularly on YouTube, there's a big drive in some sports in like football and tennis as well. And even in, in things like chess, where people at lower levels competing is super interesting to watch. I mean, hashtag United have made an amazing job for all various reasons, but that just started as a bunch of guys who were average football players playing matches against other average football players and making a big hoopla about it. And uh, you see a lot of like, tennis channels as well, where it's people who are decent players, but just normal normal men uh, playing against each other. And, and it's super compelling because you're like, oh, I know all these mistakes. Or it's like, oh, I could compete at this level. And it's just very relatable. And I think handball needs more of that. Uh, so good job, England handball. And I think the USA could probably hop on that as well. If our friends... Uh, like Joey Williams, uh, he's doing a lot of effort on, on the social side now. I think we need to see more behind the scenes stuff, you know, kind of like, you know, documentary style of just average guys and girls who are handball people making a making a bigger deal of what they're doing. I would watch that. We're going to have a Drive to Survive type series for yeah. the Irish handball team. I mean, uh, uh, yes. An average... <laughs> If it was seven years ago, <laughs> I would have, <laughs> then yes, uh, we'd have Brian follow us around. Uh, he he'd do the recording uh, and the playing, perhaps uh, seven years <laughs> seven years ago. He might might still fancy himself, um, but no, there's something there's something particularly compelling about it, and I think we should see more of it. I think there's a gap in the market there for some team to do that or some teams to do that. I think they would do very well in line among the handball community. An open call. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I've seen um, English league games before um, and lower level league games in even in Denmark before. Uh, and it's, um, 
it can be compelling. It can also be just a waste of time. So <laughs> I think that that's the extremes that you have to uh, have to it's, work with uh, at that level. Because you know, I, I agree that there can be some real excitement, but <laughs> that it needs a strong narrative. <laughs> and then you become you you start to like uh, or or like. You, you like the people who are involved. It's when you add the personality to it, and that's what Drive to Survive did for Formula One at a very different level. But it was because you suddenly actually had access to the personalities under those helmets that people actually gave a shite. It's, and that actually just that does link to a thought I've been having for a long time about Humble. And it is just the fact that there, I don't know where the personalities are in Humble. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's something holding it back. Because looking at other sports, it is the, you know, more and more people today are following players mm. than uh, teams, uh, or as opposed to teams. Uh, not that more than teams, but more people are following players as opposed to teams. And there's real personalities across many sports. So in the NBA, they've made their whole brand about that. That's their big thing. It is the players. They, you know, they trash talk to each other. They talk about them, you know, talk about each other to the media. You know, that's, it's all about that. The drama in football comes from the managers because footballers are inherently pretty boring, except for Holland, who's a, who's a bit of a character. But in general, you know, the, the, the players are relatively boring, but the managers, you know, how much conversation goes on about Klopp versus Pep Guardiola and what they say about each other. That that's the drama, that's the TV about it. As he as he said in Formula One, the the drivers have come out and people just, you know, have attachments to these uh athletes. I'm not really sure where that is in Hamble. Um I'm sure the personalities are there. It just, you know, they need to be Framed exactly. in a certain way. Exactly. Yes. And kind of really put on stage. And I think obviously one of the big uh, difficulties is that um, there's no single language that is fully linking all of these. You know, there can be a personality in Croatia who might trash talk uh, someone in Germany, but, you know, who's going to pick that up and who's going to understand any of that? <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're here for that. Well, that if anyone, we're anyone, wants to send some, anyone wants to send some of these personalities our way, we're, we're all, all ears. But I did see a huge difference when I worked at Eurobasket, because obviously I've worked at Handball Euros and Handball World Championships, and then when I worked at Eurobasket, I couldn't believe the difference in the personalities of the, the basketball players walking around. So I do think there's also an intrinsic difference between how handballers behave versus how other pe people in other sports behave while i'm sure there are personalities there in handball they really are wearing their personalities out in basketball and it's very very clear even just by the way that cl the clothes they wear when they get off the bus how they talk they have all these different handshakes it's all these little quirks and it's probably maybe probably going a little bit too far sometimes in the nba with all the the way they walk in it's almost like a catwalk uh, before the game and how important that is so there, there are negatives to that side too, but it, it was very interesting for me to see that. And uh, also how good people's English was in basketball. Like everybody had almost flawless English. And that's probably in case that you, with the influence of the NBA and America on the sport. And we don't have that in handball, really. You're probably more likely to see people who are good at German than have a really good English sometimes in certain, uh, depending on where they, come, where they came from. I think maybe maybe ten years ago or fifteen years ago, it was literally the case that people's levels of English was a lot lower, and it was more likely that to be good at German. So, um, yeah, I mean, you have people in at, at Eurobasket walk around the car and say, "Oh yeah, that's how we do. That's how we do." And I'm like, "You're from Bosnia Herzegovina. <laughs> <laughs> You're from Bosnia." <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh huh. Yeah, that's how we do. Okay. Oh okay. yeah. All right. All right. And I'm just like, geez, straight out of Sarajevo. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, <laughs> chuffing on cigarettes. That's how we do. <laughs> mm hmm. <laughs> oh, love it. Love it. All right. So there you go. Open call for the personalities and anyone who wants to showcase them will uh, will help how we can. Uh, your <laughs> last thing for me: European qualifiers for 2024 start this week. Ryan's off to Sarajevo. I'm off to Graz on uh, on Thursday for one of the the groups I'm most excited about. That one is Austria against Romania, but that also has Ukraine and Faroe Islands in it. And I think that's a really open group. 
Uh, I'm looking forward to the Faroe Islands Austria game in the weekend. Netherlands Belgium in midweek I think will be fun as well, and in the group that that Brian's going to on Thursday, Montenegro against Kosovo. I think that'll be a, a fun game in a, in that Balkan group. Here's a question for you then before we before we go who who's going to qualify for the first time for this Euro? Okay, who's going to qualify for the first time? Yeah, or a team we haven't seen in a long time at a Euro. So who's gonna who's gonna make a a long awaited reappearance or a first appearance at a Euro? I, I think that Faroe Islands there's a huge chance of Faroe Islands being there. Um Austria, Romania and Ukraine. That's uh, very equal teams there. Georgia have been getting better and better. Um they're still probably not good enough to beat out Switzerland, but who knows? Greece or Belgium? Uh, Greece, Belgium, Netherlands in that group together with Croatia. Could get a result, maybe. Netherlands, though, are... Uh, I think they're, they're good. they've stepped up yeah. in, in terms of yeah. their ranking in world handball. Um, mm. uh, even though Belgium are going to be in the world championship and qualified yeah. ahead of Netherlands, technically. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, yeah. I fancy the Faroe Islands to do a job on almost everyone in their group, so I'd, I'd fancy them yeah. to to progress there because I think they actually could, they could beat Austria on a, on a really good day, and I I think they're probably favourites against someone like Romania, and Ukraine. We don't know what to expect from Ukraine at the moment, but yeah, they definitely would be uh, there thereabouts with them. So I would I I'm going to go for the Faroe Islands, and I'd love to see it as well. Israel, I think, have a chance. Maybe a group with Estonia. And Czech Republic. Yeah, Czech Republic are beatable. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, Israel have have beaten some good teams. They've beaten Lithuania uh, recently, so um, there's something there. Um, but there something there. but maybe we'll we'll talk about it in more detail as uh, the groups tip off and uh, we see some uh, some of these teams in action against each other. Yeah. So our short podcast has been just over an hour long. <laughs> Good job. Well done. Uh, Take us home, Alex. Thank you. And we'll speak very soon again. Uh, Watch out for some Euro previews. Uh, Watch out for these short podcasts, which I hope will be a bit shorter coming to you on a weekly basis. Uh, Now that we'll be together, I just had a lot to catch up on myself Uh, after being away. I needed, you know, I was sitting there in Costa Rica, just like thinking up all of these storylines for the podcast just (laughs) on the beaches, drinking out of those coconuts, being like, oh, I really want to talk about a Faroese handball player and the European League. (laughs) Just let me at it. Uh, So uh, maybe maybe they'll be a bit quicker as it goes on. Uh, So thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, boys.